Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? That's the question that's at the heart of the story of the Good Samaritan, which is perhaps one of the best-known parables that Jesus ever tells during his ministry. This parable is so well-known that I bet that at least 90% of people in this country know at least the high-level points of it, even if they've never so much as pick up a Bible, much less read through the parable. In fact, we even in this country have what are known as Good Samaritan laws to protect those people who stop and help with the best intentions. That's how well this idea of a Good Samaritan is known in our culture. As we look at this parable that tells of a man being beaten and robbed, left for dead on the side of the road, we first see two supposedly religious men full of self-righteousness and a sense of self-importance. These two men just pass by this pitiful, pitiful victim. They don't stop to so much as see if he's even still breathing. Our reading tells us that this man who's lying on the side of the road had been left half dead. This could have gone one way or the other for this man. The man was either going to die alone on the side of the road, or he was going to somehow, by the grace of God, pull through. It all really came down to the flip of a coin on which way it was going to go. So when these two religious men just pass right by, what they're really saying is, I don't care if you die. I have things to do, and those things are more important to me than whether you live or you die. You're just simply not my problem. So they keep on walking. And of course, as we all know, another man comes walking by. This man was also traveling, much like the man who'd become a victim in the parable when he'd been attacked by robbers. As this third man comes upon the injured, half-dead man lying on the side of the road, Jesus says that he had compassion. Now, this fellow traveler, I'm sure, also had somewhere to be. He wasn't just journeying down from Jerusalem to Jericho for no reason, but certainly was on his way to accomplish something just like the priest and the Levite had been. But again, Jesus says that this third man looked down upon the bloodied man on the side of the road, and his heart broke for him. He had compassion upon this man who was in need. Because who can look upon a fellow human being in such a state and just pass them by? Well, apparently, those first two religious men in the parable could. But luckily, for the man on the side of the road, that third man who came upon him, a Samaritan, just couldn't pass him by. When we hear this parable, it seems pretty clear that we're supposed to be like the Samaritan, not like those two religious men who just passed by the man on the side of the road. We're supposed to care for and have compassion for those who are in a rough place. We're supposed to care about the lives of those around us and not just be focused on our own self-importance over the needs of others. Are we, though? When we really examine ourselves, are we closer to being the Good Samaritan or to the two men who passed right by? It seems that one of the most compelling reasons that these men passed by was because they were just too busy. Both of them served at the temple, one of them as a priest, 
So they certainly frequently were doing service to other people. It's not like they never helped people. When they come upon the man on the side of the road, though, they just can't be bothered. This isn't the time that they had set aside for serving. Or this man didn't fit into their chosen ministry. They had other ways that they served, which they apparently thought were more important. I can just picture them saying to themselves, I've already done my good deed for today, so I'm all set. Let someone else worry about this half-dead man on the side of the road. Because I have somewhere to be. It's with this kind of attitude that we can fail to see the opportunities that God calls us to when they arise. When we've compartmentalized our God time, or you know that time that we spend for serving people, or in prayer, or coming to church, and we separate that from the rest of our lives that we consider as our time, then we don't truly see what God has called us to. Now, don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying that every moment of our life needs to be spent helping random strangers on the side of the road. We have many ways that we're called to serve in our jobs, our families, our many other areas of life that do occupy our time. But we also have to be open to seeing those opportunities that God places before us each day. And we also shouldn't intentionally push those opportunities aside. Sometimes when we see someone in need, it can feel like they really brought the whole situation upon themselves. Maybe they made some poor decisions that got them into that whole mess. Whether it be substance abuse, having children out of wedlock, or maybe they're just somewhere where they shouldn't have been in the first place. When we look at the story of our reading from today, maybe that man that was attacked by robbers shouldn't have been traveling down that dangerous road alone. I mean, who would do such a thing? Or could it be that maybe he was flashing his wealth a bit too much and he attracted the robbers? I don't really know. But I do know that we are called to serve imperfect people. The man on the side of the road in our parable from today was a human being created in the image of God, and he deserved the compassion of those two religious men who just passed right by. And those imperfect people that God puts in our path, who sometimes get in the way of what we want to do that day, are also worthy of compassion. We now have five people from our congregation who are down at the National Youth Gathering in Houston, Texas. This gathering occurs every three years. As I looked at the parable of the Good Samaritan that we're going to be hearing today, I was reminded of a story that I heard about a couple teenage boys down at the National Youth Gathering in Atlanta back in 1998. These two boys were about 16 years old and they had traveled down to the gathering as part of a large group from their congregation. On one of the days of the gathering, during the lunch break, the two boys headed over to the CNN building in Atlanta to get lunch. The CNN building is the world headquarters of the news network CNN, but it also has a food court on the first floor with a variety of restaurants where you can get a meal. So it served as a great place for them to just go over and get lunch. As the two boys were approaching that building, they noticed that sitting on the sidewalk, right below the giant red CNN letters outside the building, was a man asking for money to buy food. It was, a man, it was apparent that this man was homeless and down on his luck, quite possibly due to some mistakes that he'd made in life. But the boys really had no idea. As they got closer, they noticed that every single person that walked by this man just passed right by, and they did their best to avoid any kind of eye contact. When the boys finally came close to this man, 
one of them stopped and said to him, Are you hungry? Would you like something to eat? Now, this boy had been given enough money from the leader of his group to buy lunch for that day, but he didn't really have much beyond that. However, he did know that this man was in need, so he couldn't just pass him by. He had money from back home working his fast food job that he was saving up to buy a car, so he could just swipe his debit card and spend a little bit of that to help this man. The man responded that yes, he was hungry, and that if he could just have a dollar or two, then maybe he could go and find something to eat. But the boy said to him, no, I'd like to buy you lunch myself. Come on into the food court with me. So they went inside, got in line at one of the restaurants, and while they were waiting in line, they had a bit, had a bit of a conversation while they were waiting. And then the man picked what he wanted from the lunch menu, the boy bought it for him, and he went back outside to eat his lunch. When the boys later walked by on their way back to the youth gathering, they saw the man eating his meal with a big smile on his face. It wasn't much that he'd been given, just a simple meal. But the smile on his, on his face reflected that compassion he'd been shown and being acknowledged as someone of value who just needed enough love from someone to get him through that one day. I'd like to venture a bit deeper into our parable now. As I said at the beginning of this sermon, this is a very well-known story. We've heard it many times before, and we can understand how most people tend to interpret it we can clearly see that admonition from Jesus to love our neighbor, to not just pass them by, but to show them compassion. But if we were to stop there, I think we would miss what Jesus really has for us to see in this parable. At the beginning of our reading today, before the parable, we saw a lawyer come to Jesus and ask, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Notice here that the very premise of his question is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's starting with a very important assumption. He's assuming that there's something that we can do to earn eternal life. And of course, if there's something that we can do, this man wants to know the secret. He wants to know what must he do so that he might have eternal life. So Jesus then answers him and says, what is written in the law? How do you read it? So he's saying to the lawyer, well, it's not really any secret. If you want to know what you must do to inherit eternal life, then it's all been written in the law. So what does the law say? The lawyer then recites what had been recorded in the books of Moses. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus responds with, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Follow the law, and you shall have eternal life. Do exactly what the law demands from you, and eternal life is all yours. Somewhere in the lawyer's mind, he seems to think that this is doable, though there's a bit of a technicality that he just wants to clear up real quick. He does one of the things that a lawyer does best. He quibbles over the definition of a word. And in this case, it's a quibble over a legal term, a critical definition of what it means to keep the law by loving your neighbor as yourself. You can just see that in the back of his mind, he's thinking to himself, okay, I have to love my neighbor as, your, as myself. I think I, can, I think I can do this. I think that's possible. I'm a pretty kind and loving kind of guy. I have my areas of ministry and service to people. I just need a bit of clarification on what is meant by neighbor. I might be able to do this. 
And so with that, Jesus launches into the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus' answer to the question of what it means to keep the law to the point of being able to earn eternal life is the story of the Good Samaritan. The point, though, isn't that helping someone on the side of the road occasionally is going to be enough. It's not that if you're, a ge if you're generally a good, compassionate person, then you're going to be able to get there. The point is that while we might seek to reduce the requirements of the law down to the point of something that we can fulfill, it's just not going to happen. While in our mind we can try and rationalize away the fact that the law encompasses a breath, a breath of perfection more than we can even imagine. The law always demands more. This man had had such a small idea of what a neighbor was. And so he thought he could accomplish it. But every time he thought he was there, Jesus expands it. To make it clear, you cannot fulfill that law. At the beginning of my sermon, I pose the question, are we closer to the Good Samaritan or to the two men who walked right by? When looking at that parable of the Good Samaritan, can we identify more with being the Good Samaritan or with being those two religious men who didn't stop to help? In reality, though, we're actually neither. We're not the Good Samaritan. We're not the priest and we're not the Levite. We are the man who is laying half dead on the side of the road. We're the man who's been beaten up and bloodied. But for the fact that someone might stop to help us, we will surely die. It's a 50-50 chance for us. If someone stops to help us, then we have a chance. If someone comes by and shows compassion to us, then we can make it. That's the state that we're in. So thanks be to God that Jesus, the real Good Samaritan, was sent. As Jesus looked down on us in our broken and bloodied state, on the verge of eternal death and clinging to our last breaths, then he had compassion on us. He could not pass us by and not be moved to act. Jesus was not going to pass us by and leave us for dead. He was the one who was able to perfectly keep that law and all the demands of it. Jesus Christ came to us in our broken and injured state. He bandaged us up and he brought us to a place of rest and rejuvenation. Just like that good Samaritan then paid all that was due, our Lord paid the ultimate price with his own suffering, death, and resurrection. And after paying that price, while well, we're now still being nurtured back to spiritual health through his word and sacraments, and he promises that any further debts will also be paid by his blood, Whatever it takes, he is willing to pay that price. The people listening to Jesus' words on that day, when he told the story of the good Samaritan, would have been absolutely shocked to see the Samaritan as the hero in this story. They had viewed themselves as the ones who were holy and righteous in all of their actions. But Jesus took the role of a Samaritan in the story as the ultimate hero, which was fitting because he so often served and associated himself with the outcasts of society. Those outcasts who had messy lives with lots of sin and problems. They didn't have it all together. But despite all that, he came and he restored them. He also descended down to earth, died, and rose again so that he might get involved in our very messy lives. With all the messiness of our sin and imperfection, Jesus came 
for us. He still comes to us this day in his word and sacrament, seeking to bring us forgiveness and restoration for our sin and from our messy lives. Just as he comes to us, he also sends people into our lives to receive his mercy, whether it be mercifully helping with their needs here on earth or in boldly proclaiming his eternal salvation to them. So now may the Lord bless us as we show his mercy to the world and our abundant joy and thankfulness for all that he has done for us. Amen. Please rise.